All right, so um, I was asked to give a whirlwind tour of my career because I've had a strange one. Um, although, to be honest, I think most marine scientists by my age has had a strange career. Um, so I was going to just give you a, a, an overview of the work that I've done, but sadly, or maybe happily for you guys, I won't go into too much detail on the actual work I did, but just where it took me. So um, most of the research I've done has been using food web models, and basically food web models is something like trying to balance the checkbook, for those older people in the audience, uh, or just balancing your budget for, um, for all of the species in the, in the sea or in any ecosystem. So what I've done is through my career is basically use food web models in different parts of the world. Um, and that's as much um, of the food web models I'm going to really tell you. Um, so, but why did I do that? Well, most of you in this, in this audience who are kind of undergrads um, probably want to do the stuff that's on the left hand, on the right hand side um, of your screen. We all want to go out and measure things and go out to, on ships and, you know, do exciting, be out in, the, in nature type stuff. And that's great, but the problem is you can't really do that. Well, nobody wants to pay you to just do that. I think that's the, bit, the problem. Um, so in order to get to do that, you need to try and answer the questions that's on the left-hand side of the screen. So we really want to answer policy questions like the Common Fisheries Policy, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And to do that, you need to turn the data that you collect on the right-hand side into something called information. And I've done that through ecosystem models, but there's many other ways of doing that. And that you can turn into evidence, and that can then answer policy questions. So it's a little bit convoluted, but you get to do some of the stuff you want to do in order to answer some of the questions that people want you to answer. So that's why I did that. So I'll, as I said, I'm going to give you a bit of a whirlwind tour. As Jan said, I actually grew up in Southern Africa. Um, and my first degree was, uh, actually all my degrees, was from the University of Port Elizabeth in South Africa. Um, and there I did my master's in the Crom estuary doing an estuarine study. Um, and I did my PhD on the Benguela, um, the North Benguela ecosystem off Namibia. So I'll start with that. Um, <clears throat> oh no, actually I won't, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll give you a preview. And um, from there I moved to the States where I worked on the Everglades. Again, still doing food web studies. From there, I went to Canada, Vancouver, where I did work on quite a lot of um, food webs and, and ecosystems in general. But um, the one I'm going to talk, to talk to you about is the Gulf of Alaska. Then I moved to, to Scotland, and I've been, I was there for 11 years, um, and did quite a few studies around, the, uh, around Scotland. Um, but that's when I started to actually stop just working for myself and started working with people. And that's something that I think you, the young people here should really realize. When you work with people, it's much better for your career. You learn a lot. So I worked a lot with a, a bunch of other really good scientists at the time I was in Scotland. And from there, I moved here at the beginning of last year, and I'm now working at the European Marine Board. And so I'll tell you a little bit about these as I go along. So starting with my master's, I looked at the energy flow in the Crom estuary in South Africa. The Crom estuary is a, um, is a smallish estuary on the east coast of South Africa, and they basically dammed it in the early 80s, late 70s, I think. And so um, my supervisor at the time really wanted to know what is the effect of the lack of water running, which is the opposite of what you guys have here. But there's very little fresh water coming down that estuary now. and so. Um, we basically looked at different sites along the estuary and um, went out and did sampling for these two critters, um, a mud prawn and a sand prawn. Um, and so we did that uh, for a year. I did quite a lot of field work, went out and got very wet and cold and warm and sunburned. Um, and then I used that with a whole bunch of other data that my supervisor had used, had had collected to um, create a food web model. And this is a a spaghetti diagram, I think they call it. Um, so it's a really, it's basically the combination of two years of balancing the books for the ecosystem. Um, and so that was kind of the essence of what I did for my masters. But what we found is that over time, and, and I did that for two time periods, one before the dam and uh, one and, and the other after the dam. Um, and what we found is that the ecosystem structure had changed due to the lack of freshwater inflow. So you don't really have to worry about what these indices are, but you can see that there's differences between them. So we found that the estuary had changed from a system that was dominated by plankton um, to one that was um, dominated by sub submerged vegetation and microbenthic invertebrates 
due to the lack of freshwater inflow. So you can see already here, I was looking at doing some fun science stuff out in the field, but actually answering a policy question. So I think the first thing, um, I, I'm going to give you a few life lessons as I go along, as, as I under, understood it. So the first thing I learned was you really need to find something you're passionate about. I was passionate about ecology, and I was passionate about math, and I found a way to actually put these two things together, and then it doesn't feel like you actually have a job. And Really, I'm nearly 50 and I still feel like I've never had a job. I've actually worked for 30 years and I've loved it, but it's never really just been a job. So if you find something that you're passionate about, you'll, it won't feel like you've got a job and actually you'll make a difference. So that's the first thing. So then, after that, <coughs> I enjoyed it so much that I decided I'll do it again. But this time I wanted to do it on a different system. So I worked on the Benguela ecosystem, which is off the west coast of Namibia. Um, and so the, the ecosystem, oh, let me go back there, the ecosystem is actually much bigger. It covers 180,000 square kilometers from the coastline to 500 meter depth. So it's quite a big ecosystem, very large fisheries. Um, and again, this time it took a bit longer because it was a bigger, I didn't go out sampling, unfortunately, but I did end up creating another one of these spaghetti diagrams and doing a whole bunch of interesting modeling on top of it. Um, so, and I'm not going to say too much about that other than you need to choose your supervisor really carefully. Because what happened was I decided to do a different PhD with a different set of people. And then after two months, I decided I just can't do this. So I decided to go back to my old university and do a PhD with the supervisor that I got along with really well and doing the study that I really wanted to do, regardless of whether I got paid to do it. Because in this case, I actually worked, had to work to do that. So. It's probably the most, most important decision, and I will stress this to anybody who hasn't chosen a PhD supervisor, it's the most important decision you will ever make. It's up there with choosing your husband or wife. Because this person can make a huge difference in your life. If you have a great supervisor, they will actually be your mentor, they'll be there, they will introduce you to good people, they'll make sure that you have all the opportunities that you can have, and your career will be set. If you have a bad supervisor, or one you don't get on with, they might be a good supervisor to somebody else, but they don't work for you, then you might not actually finish your PhD. So these are, I mean, seriously, I cannot overstress this point, that it is the most important decision you'll make in your career. So that's the second life lesson that I want to show you. Then um, on top of that, so I finished this in uh, 1997, I think. Oops, never mind. Maybe I'll put it there. Um, on top of that, I, I kept on working on the Benguela because it was interesting to me. So I, I started working with other people that actually also have a passion for the Benguela ecosystem. Um, and I, I did a study where we looked at how the system changed over time by looking at snapshots of the system in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Um, and the third lesson I want to tell you, is that I want to make sure that you understand, is that you really need to find other people that think the same way as you. You need to find other people that are passionate about the same things that you are. And then you have to collaborate with them. Whether there's money to do it, whether there's a way to do it, if you have to do it in your weekends, then so be it. But it's really important that the people that do the same things as you, that passionate, that got the same passion as you, that you actually end up working with them because those are the networks. The, the people sitting in this room are the networks that you'll have by the time you're my age or older. So you really, you want to find the people that have the same passions as you and stick with them because they will make you a better, a better scientist. So <coughs> that was Africa. So then, of course, as it happens, I started looking for postdocs. <coughs> and the first postdoc I got was actually in uh, Florida. Well, actually, it was in Maryland, but working on the Everglades in Florida. So there I worked with... Uh, a very, very gentle man who was Bob Yulanowicz, who I still, who's still very important in my life, even though he's retired. Again, find a good person and stick with him. Um, and I followed on from the work that Christina Bondavalli did, and we basically looked at four different ecosystems in the South Florida wetland um, system. And I'm not going to tell you much about the science, but I am going to tell you that it was the first time I saw snow. So for those of you from Africa here, you'll know how life-changing that can be because it's really weird. Um, and, and then, of course, you get snow days. 
which is amazing. Okay, maybe in here the snow days aren't so amazing because there's no downhills very much that you can go tobogganing, but really it's it's pretty fun. And it was also my first um, real Halloween party in in America. So it was it was really a great time to be and a young a young scientist in a in a great institute. So my third life fourth life life lesson is you have to take all the opportunities you get. You know, to move to America when you come from Africa and and you think you can speak English, but you definitely don't speak American. Um, that's <laughs> it's a big deal. But you really need to take those opportunities when you get, when you get them, and you just need to go for it. And I mean, I, I did great science there, but it wasn't this. I wasn't that passionate about it. But you still make sure that you do the science, you write the paper, and you move on. But enjoy it while you're there. So that's life lesson number four. So. From the Everglades, or from, from Maryland, I moved to Vancouver, which really is the most beautiful city in the world. I loved it. And as I said, I did quite a lot of food web modeling while I was there, mainly looking at impact of fisheries in different parts of the world. The system that I worked on for the longest, and that I think we did the best science, was looking at the Gulf of Alaska and changes of how that changed over time. And the reason why we were doing this was because we got some money to look at the, to look at the decline of stellar sea lions. So the, we looked at two ecosystems, <coughs> comparing the two ecosystems there. We had the um, Aleutian Islands, which I think is on the, yes. So we had the Aleutian Islands, which is kind of on the left-hand side of your screen, and it goes out nearly to, to um, Russia. And we look, also looked at the Gulf of Alaska um, ecosystem. So we basically compared these two ecosystems, because in the Aleutian Islands, the population was increasing, <clears throat> for stellar sea lions, they were doing well, but in Southeast Alaska, they were crashing. No, the other way around. In Southeast Alaska, they were doing well, and in the Aleutian Islands, they were crashing. So we were trying to figure out why that was, and we basically created two food web models for these two systems and compared them. No, I'm looking for my... um, <clears throat> and so the nice thing about food web models is that you can actually use them to play God. So we had this food web model that could could recreate this, the, the changes in the um, population for stellar sea lions in the Aleutian Islands. So you can see here, let's see, no, I'm going the wrong way. You, you can see here that the, the population was doing well in the 60s and 70s, and then after the end of the 70s, there was a big crash, and then it sort of kept on going to about 2000. So what we did in the model was we looked at all of the different hypotheses for why that was. So there was a few hypotheses that you know, we're fishing out all of their food. There's a lot of um, ki um, killer whales that feed on stellar sea lions, so maybe they're taking all of the pups. And they're actually competing with <coughs> a big flatfish that's called Aratooth flounder, or that climate change has actually caused these changes. So in the model, what we did was we basically said, OK, let's just kill off all of the Aratooth flounder. You can do that in a model, but you really can't do that in real life. So if we killed off all the Aratooth flounder in 1977, Basically, the trend in the, in the stellar sea lines in the model was the same. So you still had the increase, you still had the decline, and it wasn't as bad from about the 1990s. Okay, so that was not the answer. Okay, why don't we stop fishing for the things that stellar sea lines eat in, in the end of the 1970s? So we did that same, same trend. So still increase, still decline, but again, Actually, if, if we weren't fishing for their food, maybe after the 1990s, they would have sort of shown a little bit of a recovery. Okay, that's not it. Okay, let's kill off all the killer whales. Again, you really can't do that in real life, but you can in the model. So again, we had the same thing. Increase, decrease, and then from the 1990s onwards, you would have a sort of stabilization of the population. So we did that, um, and we saw with all of those, it doesn't answer all the questions. So then we took the driver, the climate driver that we had in the model to get all of these species to fit. It's not just stellar sea lions, but all of the other fish species that's in this, the model. And if you take the climate driver out, we didn't get the increase and we didn't get the decline. So we can see here that climate has actually had a big impact. But also, if you look at all the other lines there, after 1990, actually the population would have stabilized. So Basically, what we found there is that all of these things together cause the impact. So, lesson number five is never as simple as you think. And this is really one of the most interesting things about food web models, is that you can look at all these interactions and you can try and explain the, the impact that one thing can have on another. 
So it's really important that you work with other people that that think the same as you, but also that has complementary skills. So Sylvie Gannett, who was the first author of this paper, was a very good stock assessment person, and she was really good at doing the stuff that I couldn't do. And so working with somebody who had complementary skills made this a much better study. So that's lesson number five. So, okay, that was Canada. It was really hard to leave. I definitely didn't want to go. But eventually, you kind of have to get a real life, and you have to get a job, and so eventually I moved to the UK, um, Scotland to be precise, and I started working on a deep sea model of the west coast of Scotland and a model of the continental shelf, and as I said, I collaborated with a whole bunch of people all across, working on all sorts of different models. Um, and Scotland was great. It was a really beautiful place, but to be honest, for somebody from Africa, Scotland is a very cold and wet place. So sometimes you just have to get a real job, and you might have to move to do that. I mean, the chances of all of you getting a job in Flanders is pretty slim. You know, so you're going to have to make sure that your English is good, learn another language, and be prepared to go somewhere else if you want to stay and be a scientist. That is the bottom line. Um, so I'm going to tell you about one of the studies that we did there, which was the kind of last study we did before we came. And this was work I did with a really good, two really good postdocs, Natalia Sapretti and uh, Simone Martino. Um, they're both Italian, so they've done that thing of moving around. And Mike Burrows, who's a, a professor also at um, SAMS. So um, this is a project that was actually covering all of the UK. Um, but the, this, the, the group in, in SAMS, th that was us. And what we looked at was to, look to, to understand the UK marine ecosystems by looking at the data that exists, collecting some new data, looking at some of the models that we have, and then looking at the ecosystem services around that. So we created yet another one of those spaghetti diagrams, but you'll notice that they're a little bit more pretty now. Um, this is about 20 years later, so I'm not surprised. Um, but it, it still gives you an idea of the complexity of the ecosystem. And now we've got things like fishing um, included into these models. And so we used that model, which was kind of to just understand how, what the ecosystem looks like, to start looking at what is the impact of climate change on this system. So we included the climate change scenarios from the IPCC into our model as a driver. We also included um, how these models are um, how these species are adapted towards the temperatures that they're living in, um, the temperature envelope. And we included that into the model. And then we looked at how the, the ecosystem would look over time under these climate change scenarios if you were managing stocks correctly. So these are all managing it at um, um, total allowable catch, which is sort of how you manage fisheries here. And you can see here that, first of all, the the Dots there is the data that we have, the lines is the model, and the if you basically kept on doing what you were doing, you would see that gray seals would be increasing, cod would be collapsing, and so on. Whiting would be collapsing. Um, but if you if we look at what's happening under the different climate change scenarios, you'll see, and if you are managing it at maximum sustainable yield, which is what, how you should manage your fisheries, you'll see that, okay, um, if the, if we were managing cod at, at the, the level we're supposed to, and there was no climate change in the model, then cod would recover, which is great. Everybody loves cod. But unfortunately, climate change has put a spanner in that works, and you can't actually just say that if we manage the stock well, clim uh, cod will recover. So what's happened is, under all the different climate change scenarios, you basically see that cod won't recover. And the one where cod has the best chance is the lowest climate change scenario, which I think we've already surpassed at 2.6. Um, so basically, the bottom line is, if you live in the UK, especially with Brexit, you're going to have to pay a lot for your cod. Um, so that's, <laughs> that was the study. And, and again, really interesting study. If you were interested, I can give you the paper on that. Um, so. The conclusions from that was, and, and I'll, I'll, I just highlighted the important ones here, rising temperature has a ne negative impact on the cold-loving species like cod, and it's really important that we include the environmental change environmental change into the ecosystem if we want to manage a system um, in, sustainable, in a sustainable way that we're under ecosystem approach. So life lesson seven, and this is for those of you that are kind of a bit later in life, um, it's really important to get good students. Because if you have a good student, 
You can apply all of the life lessons that I've mentioned before to them, and then you have a new set of collaborators, which are just amazing. So, very important that you pay it forward when you get to be the, the age where you actually have your own student. And I have to say, for those of you that are PhD students, a good student makes a, a supervisor's life amazing, and similarly, a bad student can make your life hell. So, very important that once you get to that stage, pay it forward, but when you're still a PhD student, just remember you too are one day going to be a supervisor, and you too might get a student that doesn't actually deliver when they promise. So, just, just uh, important. And then the final thing I want to say is, the, I think the thing that always got to me is I always had to ask, so what? So if somebody tells me their research, I just examined a PhD student on Monday, the answer is, so what? So this is great. You spent three years and a lot of money and loads of tears to get to this wonderful, you know, thing that you've written, but, but, but so what? So please keep on asking those so what questions because that's really what makes it interesting and that also is where probably somebody is actually going to pay you to do it. Um, so finally in my whirlwind tour, I've now moved to the European Marine Board and basically what do we do? So we're actually really on that left-hand side of that graph that I showed you. We're looking at what is the policy implications of the science that's done in, without, within Europe and we create documents like future science briefs, um, position papers, policy briefs, and we've got a whole bunch of those on the stand which you, you can go and see um, outside. And I work with an amazing team who are now, you know, helping us, helping the marine scientists of Europe to actually make sure that we get to those policy questions, we answer those questions. Um, so, again, just to recap, find something you're passionate about and keep on working on it. Make sure that you meet other people that are that are interested in the same thing. Choose a good supervisor and good students. Take all the opportunities that you can get. It's never as simple as you might have thought. And you know, keep on asking those why questions. Make sure that you actually pay it forward to your students. And when you're a student, make sure that you treat your supervisor well because it'll come back eventually for you. And so that's it. Thank you very much. I think I don't know if there's time for questions now.